Sonic's 3D adventures at this point in the series had been relatively well received. The adventure games managed to walk away with tons of critical praise. However, most people would agree that Sonic Heroes was the point where Sega started losing their grip on the franchise, and for a long time they failed to meet fans' expectations. Fans dubbed this period the Dark Age of Sonic. Shadow the Hedgehog is said to be the game where Sega went down under. For some of my returning viewers, you may or may not remember that I've already reviewed this game with my buddy TCS Gaming over on his channel. I had a lot of fun participating in that video, so feel free to check it out when you have the time. That said, however, I promised you guys a retrospective video, and that's exactly what I'm going to give you. Even after all we said in that video, I still think there are some things that I need to get off my chest regarding this game. That said, before I start critiquing this game, I want to make something absolutely clear. I will not let my judgement of any game be clouded by what other people think of it. Meaning that if I genuinely like a concept or idea in a game that I'm reviewing, then regardless of what game it is, I will bring it to light. I want to say this now because from here on out my videos, especially my Sonic reviews, may be a bit controversial if my Sonic Adventure reviews weren't already. That said, let's talk about Shadow the Hedgehog, starting with the story. Shadow is seen staring at the city from afar, having strange visions of a girl named Maria. Suddenly, an alien race known as the Black Arms begins terrorising the Earth. Black Doom, their leader, tells Shadow to bring him the Chaos Emeralds as promised. Confused, Shadow embarks on a journey to uncover the secrets of his past. Now, I want to bring up something that fans take issue with. Why would Shadow believe Black Doom? My answer to that being, I don't think he does. His exact words were, get the Chaos Emeralds. He never said he was going to give them to Doom. As for why he doesn't trust Sonic and company, part of me can't defend that. While it's true that Sonic and company don't know the full extent of Shadow's history, they at least know something. They know that Shadow was created to help Professor Gerald's sick granddaughter Maria. Furthermore, they know about the Ark and how Shadow died. And no, Shadow doesn't remember the space colony up until this game. I'll let this slide as far as the opening, but somebody should have spoken up and given Shadow some direction instead of letting him wander like a lost puppy. The Black Arms introduction is completely abrupt. In the adventure games, while we may be introduced to the Monster of the Week pretty early, we're not sure who they are and more importantly, what their ambitions are. Take Shadow in Adventure 2 for example, we're given a brief exchange between him and Sonic. After that, Shadow refers to himself as the ultimate life form and then buggers off using Chaos Control. Who he is and what side he's on is still very much a mystery, assuming you didn't play Heroes first of course. Here, the Black Arms literally fall from the sky and start wrecking shit up. I think the problem when it comes to the legitimacy of Shadow siding with Doom is that he's immediately painted as a villain front and centre. The sense of salty doesn't get any better as far as I'm concerned. I think this opening would have worked better if we were introduced to the heroes and Black Doom at the same time to fit with the game's key mechanic, choosing who you align with. I'll also make the argument that Shadow forgetting what Maria wanted for the human race was the main catalyst for why Shadow decided to do the destructive things he did. Using the same logic, Shadow going maverick in this game doesn't seem all that far-fetched, especially when Amnesia is once again a major player here. We're only at the intro, and we're not even at the thick of it yet. Now this is the part where I talk about how the story unfolds, but in Shadow the Hedgehog's case, this is a choose your own adventure game. Your actions and the levels will impact the storyline you end up experiencing. Shadow could choose to take over the Earth and serve Black Doom, or he could choose to help Sonic perform his daily ass kicking routine. This is a very cool idea, I think. The problem is that all ten of these pathways are not written well. Doubly so if you choose to meander between the pathways. I won't cover all 10 endings, but rather flag up some ideas that could have been improved and expanded upon. A big letdown for me is Shadow's overall characterisation. Shadow's always been an introvert, it's part of who he is and I'd argue it's part of his appeal. He's more talkative here about the consequence of being a total dick. In the Dark Pathway this makes sense because we're supposed to find him despicable. On the hero storyline, however, I honestly can't tell whose side he's on. His first instinct when Tails crushes his plane isn't, is he alright, but rather, how can I steer this Chaos Emerald? Or how about where Shadow takes the Emerald right from under the hero's nose is? AKA, the power source for the ship they're currently occupying. 
and what is up with Shadow's total disdain for Sonic. I get that they're meant to be polar opposites personality-wise, but I never got the vibe that Shadow hated Sonic in Adventure 2. In fact, I dare say by the end of the story in that game, they actually respected each other. I'm not expecting Shadow to be fully tolerant of Sonic's behaviour, but I wish that the game would actually make it look like that they're on the same side. Again, Shadow occasionally getting annoyed by Sonic still needs to be a factor of the hero's storyline because it's part of his character. It would also give some explanation as to why Shadow would turn his back on Sonic. It's not a very good one, mind you, but it's an explanation nonetheless. It feels forced and very half-assed. If you ask me, there should have been a cutscene of Black Doom trying to sway Shadow to his side, taunting him with the fact that he's the only one that knows the secrets to his past. That would be a good inner conflict near the end of the hero pathway, as Shadow would have to choose between keeping his promise to Maria and learning about his past. The neutral pathway is probably the most controversial for many reasons. The biggest is that at the end of the pathway, Shadow turns out to be an android. The neutral pathway only requires you to get to the goal ring like any other traditional Sonic game, so this is the ending that first time players are most likely going to see. If you wait about 10 minutes on the final boss, Eggman will contact you and say that the shadow you're playing as is actually the real deal. Why you would ever want to wait that long is beyond me. If the game was to ditch the choose your own adventure storyline and just follow traditional narrative conventions, it should have culminated with Shadow actually turning out to be a robot. It would make sense with everything that we've seen so far, and as for Omega's little quote, The original must exist somewhere. Sega could have easily written that off by saying that Eggman found the corpse of the original Shadow and used it to make the Shadow androids. Having the shadow you're playing as turn out to be a robot would make for a really bittersweet ending. Sweet because we finally get closure on his whole story arc that was started in Sonic Heroes, and bitter because it's the outcome that fans neither wanted nor expected. I would also say that the ending probably would have worked better when put into context with the plot line that I just came up with, but I'll discuss that later. As for the flashbacks that Shadow gets from time to time, it could be argued that his memories are purely artificial, due to him being an exact replica from the Shadow that died in Adventure 2. I apologise sincerely if I'm going off into headcanon territory here. It's just that I find Shadow the Hedgehog a very interesting case when it comes to analysing video games. Massive quotation marks there. I'll always point out when a game does something good or bad and give it praise or criticism whenever it's needed. However, some of the most fun I have when writing these reviews is not necessarily harping on negative aspects of a game. I'll always be honest with you guys, but I rather like looking at things that other reviews didn't like and offering a different perspective. Besides, shitting on a game that so many other people have shat on before can only be funny so many times. I will make exceptions, mind you, but that's for next time. Let's backtrack a little bit here. I really don't know what to think about these flashback sequences. In fairness, they don't come out of nowhere, as they're usually tied to events that relate to Sonic Adventure 2 or Heroes. An example being when Shadow ends up on the remains of Prison Island. He remembers being released by Eggman from that massive fridge. The flashbacks highlight one of the biggest problems I have with Shadow the Hedgehog's narrative. They are counterproductive. From a newcomer's perspective, they're supposed to fill players in on the events that occurred in the previous games. As a person who played Shadow the Hedgehog years before he played Sonic Adventure 2, I can speak from experience when I say, a still image and a crappy filter does not provide enough context to really grasp what's going on. Equally, there are callbacks that I think should have been implemented. Want a good example? How about the moon? No, I'm not just saying that to get a cheap laugh, I'm genuinely being serious here. One moment in the hero pathway that seems incredibly contrived is when Shadow comes across Sonic. In the middle of Eggman's base, mind you. And wouldn't you know it, he just happens to be going to Space Colony Ark. We're on our way to the Ark, so I guess that means we're going too. That doesn't even make grammatical sense. Think about it, the Broken Moon could have given Shadow's memory a jumpstart as it was a key event in Adventure 2. This would then give a logical explanation as to why Shadow would want to team up with Sonic and explore the Ark. But what about the players who are coming in with prior knowledge of Sonic Adventure 2? Well in that case, the premise of the plot gets even more problematic. Part of the appeal when it comes to a character and memory loss is that when they make a discovery, so do you. But that's the issue here, because we, as fans, already know everything that happened to Shadow. 
so what do you do? There were still a lot of unanswered questions when it came to Shadow's backstory in Adventure 2. The game doesn't explicitly state this, but in Sonic Adventure 2, the reason why Shadow was created in the first place was that Maria was actually dying from a life-threatening illness called MIDS, hence why she couldn't go down to the Earth herself. In response to this, Professor Gerald wanted to create the ultimate life form, and that's where Shadow comes in. Again, it's not something brought up in SA2, but it was written in the Japanese manual. I think, anyway, don't quote me on that. Either way, it's part of the Archie comics, so it's written in Sonic canon somewhere. This is something I want to know more about, but Shadow the Hedgehog fails to capitalise this at the cost of what I believe could have been an interesting origin story. They do dabble in this area a little bit, like the attack on the Ark, but not enough to the point where it leaves me fully satisfied. So we've covered the neutral and hero pathway, but how does the Dark story fare? Honestly, this is probably my favourite of the three. I really like how Black Doom recreates the gun raid on the Ark to manipulate Shadow into doing his bidding. At the same time, Shadow backstabbing Doom for the sake of overthrowing him makes so much more sense than Shadow switching sides just to kick the shit out of Sonic. I am the ultimate hedgehog! Yeah, you sure are, kiddo. Though the Dark story also has its issues. A lot of the time, Shadow just sits there like a mental sponge, listening and repeating to whatever Black Doom tells him. I don't think that this was a big issue, but I do at least wish that Shadow would question some of the stuff that Black Doom tries to tell him. Also, you remember that part in SA2 where Eggman blows up the moon using the Eclipse Cannon, with six Chaos Emeralds no less? Well, apparently doing the exact same thing to the White House is only as powerful as your average nuclear warhead. Not only that, but the president survives the blast. How the fuck is that possible? That's pretty much how I feel about the most important storylines. Trust me, I'm four pages into this script already. If you're expecting me to do individual rundowns of all ten endings, I hate to leave you hanging, but I have to move on. With every choice you make, you'll gain some allies, but you'll also make just as many enemies to deal with. Representing the dark side is Black Doom. He's an evil alien that wants to enslave humanity, that's pretty much all there is to him. If you decide to go neutral, then you'll cross paths with good old Dr. Eggman. While we're on this subject, one of the biggest disappointments I've had with the multiple pathways is not being able to side with the Eggman Empire. Despite the fact that you help Eggman activate his volcanic defense systems in the previous level. Oh, Shadow only did that to stop everybody else from getting to Eggman. Really now? Finally, there's the gun commander, who has a vendetta against Shadow, as Maria was his only friend and blamed Shadow for her death. Many people, including myself, have stated that this makes no logical sense, as he works for Gun, the people who were behind the attack. However, when stepping back a bit, I began to read between the lines and applied my own theories to how this could be explained. The game explains that everybody aboard the Ark, with the sole exception of Professor Gerald, was killed to cover up the experiments being conducted aboard the Ark. This implies that the gun commander, we'll call him Tim, wasn't there at the time of the attack. The murder of a handful of innocent researchers probably isn't something that the government wanted to go public, leading Gun Commander Tim to make his own conclusion. Since the birth of Shadow was indented into his head, he ultimately uses Shadow as a scapegoat. I'll stop with the fan theory bullshit now, I think you've heard enough of my rambling for one day. This leads into what I believe could have been a well executed scene, had it not been for sloppy writing. The Gun Commander has a revelation that Shadow isn't the cold blooded killer he originally depicted him to be. Further complimenting this is when Shadow tells him that if everything the Gun Commander said about him is true, then he will begrudgingly accept the consequences of his actions. I think this really paints Shadow in a sympathetic and almost tragic light. I can say that this moment in the semi-hero story was one of the only times I was rooting for Shadow. But we're not done yet, because after you've cleared all 10 endings, you've still got the last story to go through, which means all those other stories we went through aren't actually canon. And you know what? I don't have a problem with that. It's called Choose Your Own Adventure for a reason. Besides, if Sonic Team made every ending canon, then they'd quickly write themselves into a corner when it comes to bringing Shadow back in the next game. They already have enough trouble trying to write Knuckles competently, so I welcome the last story. However, I still have a problem with this story in that it's never explained what actually happened and what didn't happen. When you resume your save file, like the adventure games before it, Shadow will give you a quick recap as to what happened in the last play session. This is something I feel that the last story really could have used just to clarify what happened up until this point. Shadow has made his way onto the Black Comet, home of the Black Arms, and has managed to gather all seven Chaos Emeralds along the way. Black Doom appears and tells Shadow to give him the Chaos Emeralds, but then Sonic shows up and tells Shadow to give him the Chaos Emeralds. 
We then get a massive exposition dump as Black Doom tells us his motives. Basically, he wants to harvest human flesh to stop humans from killing each other. So, he's killing them to stop us from killing ourselves. What? That makes no fucking sense whatsoever, but just roll with it. Black Doom then goes on to say that the reason why he knows so much about Shadow is that he was actually involved in his creation process. Essentially, this is trying to be an Empire Strikes Back moment. I would play the clip, but you know Disney, so better not risk it. Suddenly, everyone becomes paralysed, except for Shadow, for absolutely no reason whatsoever. Because isn't he a badass? After chasing down Black Doom, Shadow has just about had enough of this nonsense, but Black Doom lets him know that he's still in control. Meanwhile, aboard the Ark, the Chaotix find a recording of Professor Gerald. The Professor explains that while he was in the process of creating the ultimate life form, he needed some of Black Doom's blood to complete the project. As promised for his help, Gerald promised that Shadow would deliver Black Doom the Chaos Emeralds once the Black Comet makes its return. In response to this, Gerald created the Eclipse Cannon to destroy the Comet before the Black Arms had the chance to invade Earth again. I can buy that, so I'm not going to complain. What I will complain about though is how Shadow's suddenly starting to resist mind control. I get it, Shadow's cool, but he's way too overpowered. Leave the Gary Stu moments to amateur fanfic writers. Keep that shit out of my video games. Shadow transforms into a super state and slaughters Black Doom. With the power of Chaos Control, Shadow teleports the Black Comet into outer space. Using the Eclipse Cannon, the Comet is destroyed and everybody admits that they were wrong about Professor Gerald. Truly, he is our Lord and Saviour. Uh, no. I do agree that it was a good idea to make the people of Earth understand why Gerald did the things that he did in Adventure 2. However, there's a difference between being sympathetic and just ignoring the past for the sake of a peaceful resolution. Yes, Professor Gerald is a very tragic character, and yes, I do feel for him. However, there's no getting around the fact that this guy was going to doom the human race as we know it. The game ends with Shadow officially putting his past behind him. Now this moment has always confused me. What reasons would Shadow have to want to give up on his past? It's been the driving force of the plot and all of a sudden Shadow just doesn't care anymore? Why? Surely he has more of a reason than ever to find out after what Black Doom told him. For all Shadow knows, he could be lying. For that matter, if Shadow used the Chaos Emeralds to go super, then surely he must still have them. It's not like he has to go through the arduous task of collecting them again. This ending is my main argument as to why I think it would have been a better idea to make Shadow a robotic copy. All his memories that you've seen so far throughout the game would be nothing but artificial. The ending would make more sense because everything Shadow thought he knew about himself would be completely meaningless in the long run. But that's enough plot for one video I think. The voice cast has seen some drastic changes this time around, originating from the four kids dub of Sonic X, a show that not many people like and honestly I can't blame them. Ignoring that, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that the voice cast in this game is my favourite out of the three we've had so far, as contradictory as that may sound. Shadow in particular being voiced by Jason Griffith, who as it turns out, also voices Sonic. I'm seriously conflicted as to which Shadow I like better. On one hand, David Humphrey's performance gives him a mysterious vibe, something that was key to Shadow's character in Sonic Adventure 2. But I cannot deny that Jason Griffith's Shadow is a force to be reckoned with. He's cocky, but not in the same in-your-face way as Sonic. He isn't afraid to go against any challenger if it means getting what he wants. As you don't really spend much time with the rest of the Sonic characters, I'll wait until the next games to discuss what I think of them. I do want to draw your attention to one particular actor though. Sean Chamel, also known as the voice of Goku in the Funimation dub of Dragon Ball Z, also voices Black Doom in Shadow the Hedgehog. And if that doesn't blow your mind, then I don't know what will. If there's something I can give Shadow the Hedgehog props for, it's the character animations and lip syncing. This is still not fantastic, mind you, but it's a hell of a lot better than what we've gotten over the previous games. One other thing I'd also like to touch upon is the unspoken rule of the internet that Shadow the Hedgehog attempts to be dark and mature, which a lot of people seem to take issue with. In my honest opinion, this game seems more immature and confused more than anything. For a game that wants to try and stray away from the series it represents, it sure does have a hard time of letting go of its usual tropes. Like theme parks, haunted houses and the occasional hidden base, with Eggman's goofy ass face plastered all over it. Some might enjoy this, but I feel that it creates some serious mood whiplash. Say for instance, in one level you're on a destroyed highway, and in the next, you're somewhere you'd take your kids for a day out. If this was your run-of-the-mill traditional goofy Sonic game, then I wouldn't mind this so much. 
However, it's because Shadow the Hedgehog tries to take itself seriously that I take issue with this. Where's that damn fourth Chaos Emerald? Ah yes, swearing. A lot of the time I feel like the characters are little kids, swearing when they're not supposed to because they think it's funny. Jack and Daxter threw in the odd curse word every now and then, but the difference is compared to this game is that at no point did the cursing feel tacked on or forced, unlike the clip I just played you. In addition, Jack and Daxter didn't really have 14 years of reputation built up at this point. So how about that gameplay? To cut Shadow the Hedgehog some slack, I do think the controls is better than Sonic Heroes. I'd still take the adventure games any day of the week though, so make of that as you wish. You'll begin the game in Westopolis. Shortly after you gain control, you'll be introduced to the game's main gimmick, as Sonic tasks you with killing all the Black Armed Soldiers. Similarly, Black Doom wants you to kill all the humans, but if you don't care about any of that, you can choose to be neutral, which just involves heading straight to the goal ring. Your progression through the story and the ending you get will be determined by what missions you choose to do. There are three different outcomes, and as per usual, you'll need to see them all in order to unlock the last story. Now while this isn't a perfect system, because trust me, it's not, I do think it's a hell of a lot better than just playing the same stages again four times like in Sonic Heroes. I know this also comes with the issue of playing with Stopless ten times. While I'm not going to defend that level entirely, I do genuinely like Westopolis. As a kid, I thought it was really exciting seeing all the laser strikes and all the destroyed scenery. Ten years later, it doesn't quite have the same effect, but it's in keeping with the game's tone and sets the mood rather well. The music here is also a track I happen to like. It's fast-paced, gritty, and effectively conveys the drama of the situation. Shadow the Hedgehog, while not fantastic in the music department, does have a handful of tracks I really like. Recommendations go to the Egg Dealer, Sky Troops, and Circus Park tracks. The best song of all of them, though, has to be the amazing Doctor of Beatnik mix, which is a remix of Eggman's theme from Adventure 2. Shadow the Hedgehog also has some fantastic vocal tracks, Never Turn Back being one of my favourite songs in the whole series. All Hell Shadow is pretty good too, though I'll always prefer Sonic 06's rendition of it. A good majority of the missions are your basic kill everything in the level scenario. These types of missions are a pain in the neck as there are only a set amount of enemies in each level, so if you accidentally miss one, you'll have to slowly comb your way through the level all over again. On the flip side, most of the levels are fairly linear, so as long as you look in every nook and cranny, you shouldn't miss any. Although, even still, this goes against the point of a Sonic game, you know, going fast. In some other instances, like Lost Impact or The Doom, trying to find where you need to go can be a real chore. This is no doubt thanks to the maze-like level structure and the fact that everything looks the goddamn same. It really makes me laugh that Sonic Team thought that these maps on the walls were actually helpful. And at one point in development, they did actually have a radar. Why the fuck would you consider taking something that vital out of a game? In fact, I learned from my collab that one of the enemies in the evil mission is actually glitched. To the game's credit, you can be warped to individual locations using checkpoints. This is much better than Team Chaotix East Grand Metropolis, where you have to continually loop through the level. The other types of missions usually consist of destroying an armored vehicle before it escapes, or finding a certain amount of a given object. Thankfully, if there are missions that you don't want to do, there are other ways of getting you to your desired story path. Meaning that you're never forced to hunt down the artificial chaos in Lost Colony if you don't want to. Though this does mean playing the same levels you've already played again, so pick your poison. You have a lot of choice as to how you want to progress. In fact, there are over 300 different combinations. Dare I ask, has anyone gotten them all? Shadow the Hedgehog in terms of offense can still use the homing attack, but it's certainly not as effective as it used to be. Like in Sonic Heroes, the enemies are still rocking health bars. Luckily for you, Shadow has other means of dishing out pain. You can pick up various firearms and other weapons that can be used to make the enemies look like complete pushovers. Sonic fans didn't take too kindly to Shadow Pack and Heat, but surprisingly, they're actually the best part of the game for me. Guns like pistols and rifles have auto-aim. It's very fun just to jump in the air and wave your gun around like an absolute madman, massacring everything that stands in your way. Bazookas, on the other hand, sacrifice precision for raw power. If you decide to go after any of the good guys, your evil meter will fill up and vice versa. 
This gives you access to two different Chaos Powers. Chaos Control, which allows you to skip a large chunk of a level, and Chaos Blast, which is essentially a massive explosion. Chaos Blast isn't all that helpful. Why? Because when one of your meters maxes out, you have infinite ammo, so as long as you keep shooting at enemies, it will never run out. The problem with Chaos Control is that it's very situational. Unless the mission requires you to get to the Gold Ring or a variation on that objective, then you really can't get much use out of it. Ah well, infinite ammo is okay with me. Killing the good guys will increase your dark score, and killing any black arms will increase your hero score. Say if you beat the hero mission in the level, your dark score will detract from your hero score. That alone I don't find any fault with. I think it's a nice incentive to prevent you from mindlessly attacking your allies. The problem comes in when your current route is blocked and you have to kill your buddies in order to progress. Take the Dark Mission in Glyphic Canyon for example, where Black Doom tells you to reactivate the ruins by touching these orbs. To get to the last orb you need to unlock a spring which is in a box. You do this by killing black armed soldiers. The most irritating part of all this is that your partner will scold you for it. Well, what else was I supposed to do, asshole? Your men were right next to the fucking things and they were doing jack shit. In fact, even better is that the faction you're currently siding with will actually start shooting you. In games like Metal Gear Solid 4, for example, some levels would put you in the middle of an ongoing conflict, and depending on who you side with, you'll be rewarded with an extra pair of hands to help you out. Sometimes they'd even give you healing items. That's awesome. I know it might be a little bit unfair to compare a late 6th generation game as opposed to a game released early in the 7th generation, but my point is, is that Shadow had the chance to implement a really cool gameplay feature, but they failed to capitalise. There is, however, a very simple way to fix this that doesn't involve tweaking the game's AI whatsoever. Instead, why not have multiple pathways depending on your allegiance? That way, you could stick certain enemy types in one pathway, so you don't have to worry about backstabbing. Additionally, it would help to mitigate the tedium of having to play the same stages over again. For the record, having to do six stages to complete the pathway is still fucking dumb, I'm not using it as a defence. Some great examples to demonstrate my points are the levels Lava Shelter and Space Gadget. In the case of Lava Shelter, you could just head to the Gold Ring, which is the hero option. If you choose to help Eggman, you have to activate the five volcanic defense systems. Not only is this objective clear and very simple, but it also fills the stage with lava. This A adds some extra challenge to a previously beaten level, but more importantly B gives you a different pathway to traverse. An excellent example of this is in the level Space Gadget, which might as well be called Sonic Adventure 2 The Level. In said level, the hero mission can once again be cleared by getting to the goal ring, except this time you have to beat it in under a certain time. The Dark Mission has you destroy five of the Ark's defense systems. Sound familiar? By destroying these defense systems, you'll be sent to a different pathway completely separate to the hero mission. I know that I'm skimming past some of the more tedious missions like the bomb mission in Mad Matrix and the hellhole that is Central City's bomb mission. Man, there are a lot of bomb missions in this game. I guess you could say this game is the bomb. Ah, fucking kill me. The reasons why I'm not doing that is because me and Trey already did plenty of that in our collab and if I was to do it, We'd be here for a fucking eternity, stares at my Sonic 06 script. To be fair, a lot of the more bullshit missions are completely optional if you just decide to follow a pathway from start to finish. If more levels were designed like Lava Shelter or Space Gadget, then Shadow the Hedgehog not only has the potential to be a good Sonic game, but a great one. I'm not gonna lie, if you were to tell me that this is one of your favourite Sonic games, I can see why. That doesn't mean I agree with you, but there are some good ideas to be found in Shadow the Hedgehog. It's because of these ideas that prevents me from just writing this game off as pure shit. Would you believe me if I told you that Shadow the Hedgehog actually went out of its way to improve a few gameplay features from the last games? Grinding, for example, is significantly less dangerous from both Sonic Heroes and Adventure 2. Instead of tapping the jump button and holding the desired direction to switch rails, Shadow can now press left and right to do so automatically. This is fantastic, and I will absolutely give Shadow the Hedgehog credit for this. 
In addition, the light speed dash in Adventure 2 and Heroes was prone to failure if you weren't lined up correctly. Now in Shadow, the light speed dash always leaves behind a transparent trail of rings, so you're never at the risk of dying. These may seem like small gameplay features, but they are long-standing problems that Shadow the Hedgehog went out of its way to fix, in which I appreciate this. Finally, Shadow can now ride vehicles, and honestly, even as a kid, I found these to be a massive disappointment. The walker and the hover saucer are fun at times, but the bike is one of the biggest letdowns for me. What makes me laugh is that Shadow the Hedgehog can actually run faster on his feet than a good majority of these vehicles. Lethal Highway had the potential to be Shadow the Hedgehog's equivalent to City Escape. I say that because there are clearly jump ramps on the road, and yet, you don't have the ability to do any stunts. Call me picky, but one of my favourite parts of SA2 was blazing through the streets of San Francisco and trying to get points as I go. Seriously though, I really do like that intro. The CGI found in Shadow the Hedgehog for my money is still one of the best looking in the entire series. In a word, it is fantastic. The in-game graphics, on the other hand, don't really tickle my fancy. I understand the colour choice given the tone of this game, but at least give me something interesting to look at. I think the only levels that I really like the look of is Westopolis and by extension Lethal Highway, Gun Fortress, Prison Island, The Ark and the two cyberspace levels. Thematically, most of the ones I just mentioned are still pretty dull, but at least the concept of the levels still holds my interest. I've already mentioned the laser strikes, but in Gun Fortress there's a section where you look through the perspective of a security camera. While in these sections, you have to sneak by without getting spotted, otherwise you get shot at. That's just one example of how a boring colour scheme can still hold my interest without resorting to completely changing the mood altogether. I mean, come on, you could do so much more with an alien vessel than just hentai. Shadow the Hedgehog has very few bosses, so there's not really much to talk about here. A lot of them can be beaten in a matter of minutes with a combination of firearms and chaos powers. Sonic and Diablon, however, are a pain in my ass because Diablon has a shield that will go down each time he tries to attack you. Even after he's been knocked down, the fight can still take forever due to the homing attack being your primary source of offense for this fight. You can finish him off pretty quickly once you have your chaos energy maxed out, but getting to that point is still an arduous task. One boss I do really like is actually the Egg. Dealer. Essentially, Eggman has a slot machine on his robot, and you have to hit all three corresponding buttons. If you hit all three buttons in time, the weapon that Eggman will fire, either missiles or bombs, will backfire on him, causing massive damage. Shadow Fever will max out your evil energy, giving you an opportunity to spam Chaos Blast. If you don't end up hitting the buttons in time, then Eggman's weapon will work as intended. There are a lot of questions left unanswered with this boss, such as why would Eggman program a mode that actually powers up Shadow? My response to that being, it's a video game, and secondly, it's much, much better than some of the other shit he's invented in the past. It's not perfect, but I like the concept here. One other gripe I have is the fact that the character models for the main Sonic cast is ripped right out of Sonic Heroes. To be blunt, I find this downright lazy. I think they should have returned to the SA2 art style. Sonic Heroes was clearly inspired by the Genesis games, which really doesn't fit with the tone of Shadow the Hedgehog. While we're on the subject of graphics, I don't think Shadow the Hedgehog is impressive at all. I could blame it on the tone of the game, however, there were 6th generation console games that looked way better than Shadow. Jack and Daxter, made in 2001, a launch title for the PlayStation 2, looks better than Shadow the Hedgehog, and so does the rest of the series, might I add. Luigi's Mansion, once again made in 2001, GameCube launch title, pretty drab art style, looks more appealing than Shadow the Hedgehog. So blaming it on the tone isn't really an excuse. Sonic Heroes looks miles better than this game. Overall, would I recommend Shadow the Hedgehog? While I won't deny that this game has its appeal, I just can't get into it. I think it would be fair to say that Sonic Heroes is more accessible just for the fact that it's easier to understand. But to say everything in Shadow the Hedgehog is complete shit wouldn't be fair in the slightest. There is a good nugget of an idea here, and I would seriously encourage Sega to give it another whirl. Perhaps not in a Sonic game, but maybe with a new intellectual property. I would say, if you're interested to see what this game has to offer, then give it a go. You probably won't be hurting your wallet too badly. 
Just know that this is not your run-of-the-mill Sonic game. I can see why this game is fans, but as for me, I rarely go back to this one, and that really shows when you find out I've only beaten this game a grand total of twice. I've tried to beat this game again on several occasions, but by the time I get to the fourth playthrough, I get kind of bored. If you like Shadow the Hedgehog, more power to you, who am I to tell you what you can and can't enjoy? That said, it's finally time we discuss the game that almost killed the Sonic franchise. You know the one. Next time we meet, we'll be reviewing Sonic the Hedgehog 2006. Pray for me.